When we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren had received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went with us to James, and all the elders were present. After receiving them, he related one by one by one the things God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are the zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them Okay, we are back after Michaelmas in the narrative of the Acts of the Apostles. Paul has completed his second missionary journey. He leaves Ephesus, heads toward Jerusalem. This morning he arrives in Jerusalem and he goes and meets with St. James, James of Jerusalem and the elders of the church. And so when he gets there, he uh, relates to them and tells them the story of his missionary journey, how God did marvelous things uh, in, in the midst of the Gentiles. He tells them of all his uh, adventures, you know, getting beaten and bloodied and the riots and, and all of the stuff that happens and, and the tremendous success he has seen through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so James and all the elders uh, give thanks and glorify God for all that happens. And then James says, but, <laughs> But uh, all the, the Jewish believers, not Gentile believers, but the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem, uh, they're not too happy with you. They have heard and they understand that, that, that you have thrown completely away the law of Moses uh, and that you're telling the, the uh, Gentiles that none of that stuff matters. So, so Paul, what we need to do now is there are four men who are ready to, to take their vow and shave their heads and I want you to pay for their expenses and, and pay for the offerings that they have to give in the temple and purify yourselves yourself with them just to show the Jewish people that you haven't thrown and cast aside all the laws of Moses and the traditions and customs of Judaism. <laughs> so it's at this point, uh, or at least this is my understanding when I read it, uh, it's, it's at this point that Paul has a decision to make. Um, a tough decision like on a bad day I, I can see myself making this decision and saying hey James no no you, you must not know who I am you must not have heard of me I just did incredible miraculous things I just overcame beatings and getting bloodied and almost dying several times and being thrown in prison and and riots and and miraculous things happened to me I am not going to make a concession because there's some people that that don't think that I'm legitimate or some people that are upset with me, those people need to get a grip. That's one choice you can make, but that's not what he does. Paul says, yes, sir. He doesn't ask any questions, doesn't raise any argument. He doesn't uh, try to do anything. He takes the edict direction of James, Bishop or apostle of Jerusalem. At this point, uh, probably the most powerful or prominent uh, authority and he goes with the four men he pays for their offerings and pays for them to go through the rites of purification uh, and stays with them uh, you know James does make a concession hey look I've also you know told all the Gentiles uh, that, that they have to abstain from from strangled animals and from blood and from unchastity so they have to they have to live within historic Judaism to some degree we can't eat uh, food offered to idols. We can't uh, engage in in Roman or Greek philosophies about hedonism, things like that. We have to, you have to do that. But you, you uh, have to prove to the Jewish Christians that you have not cast aside uh, the traditions of Moses. And so, Paul does. Yes, sir. And he does. So that gets to humility and obedience. So here, Paul uh, is certainly a person. Uh, like I said, one of the most learned, uh, intelligent, successful, prominent uh, people in all of Israel. He was one of the most prominent Jewish people before he became Christian. Now, as a, as a 
since he's accepted faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's one of the most successful church planners, evangelists. There's nothing this guy can't do. He's at the top, he's on the top shelf of everything. So he really has little reason to, to be obedient. Reason, no reason except for love for our Lord and love for his people. So in humility and in obedience, he doesn't question. He realizes that he needs to make concessions to both Jew and Gentile that are within the church. He realizes that he needs to work for reconciliation, work for unity, uh, and also follow the edict of the leader. And, 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 and he does. So in our lives, in our everyday lives, uh, for you and for me, uh, there's a lot to be learned in there. We live, at least my understanding, we live in a time and a place where people, obedience is uh, seen as weakness. Humility is seen as weakness. So people argue, people buck the system, people uh, lash out against authority and, and all kinds of things. You can see that everywhere. And in the church, there's 1,500 Christian denominations in these United States. If I don't like what somebody says to me, I'm gone. If I don't like what, what's going on, I'm gone. I'll, I'll make my own church right down the road. It shouldn't be, be that way. Uh, part of a life of faith, part of love for God and love for Jesus is humility and obedience. Part of that is, is holding the feelings and concerns and weaknesses uh, of, of others above yourself. So sometimes that means having to just say yes sir and, and do what you're asked to do. Do what you're asked to do for the good of, of people who are doubting you, who have concerns, for the good of bringing all together for the good of God. You know, Jesus shows the ultimate uh, obedience and humility as he goes willingly to his death on the cross um, and gives us that example. So think about in your own lives, uh, when you make the first decision, you know, the one that says, I ain't doing that, you don't know who I am. I'm not answering to anybody. Here's my credentials. They speak for themselves, get stuffed. And think about what that second option could do. It could bolster the faith of others. It could bring about unity. It could bring about togetherness, strength. It could show people your true character, that you're not above anybody else, that, that you love them enough to make those concessions. You, you, you love them enough to offer yourself to them as a, as a servant. You, you love them enough to take their weaknesses and their issues and problems and, and difficulties and, and put those above your own self. So obedience and humility. Uh, contemplate those things. Paul, Paul had them in spades. Like I said, Paul, top shelf in, in, in everything in his life. Uh, a true uh, evangelist among evangelists and apostle among apostles and uh, philosopher and, and leader and tougher than nails. <laughs> but, but yet he understood humility and obedience were essential for life and community and for unity, for, for getting along and bringing people together. So contemplate those things. Have a great day. Love one another. Be kind to one another. Care about one another. Say, say your prayers and reach out and, and tell others you're thinking about them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.